Good evening. It's good to be with you this evening. Uh, my name is David Williamson and I count it a privilege to be asked to share with you a message from the Word of God. I want to speak to you this evening about God fully and finally revealed to us. And uh, with that in mind, we're going to read in the book of Hebrews and chapter 1. And maybe before I read that, I have just a little comment or two about the book of Hebrews itself. Hebrews is a book with a, a doctrinal purpose. Uh, the intent of the book really is to show the superiority of, Christ, uh, of Christianity to Judaism. And so 13 times over in the book we have the word better mentioned. There are these comparisons made between Judaism and Christianity and there's a constant recognition that what the Christian has is better. Um, in fact, we're going to read in a minute here in verse number four of chapter one that the Lord Jesus is referred to as so much better than angels. Uh, and there's a reason for that. The book refers to better things and a, a better uh, testament and better promises and better sacrifices. And so we could go on to consider these different things that are better. The point really is the, the superiority of Christianity. And that superiority of Christianity is linked with the supremacy of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a book written some time ago by a man called Griffith Thomas. And the name of the book was just Christianity is Christ. And, and that is very true. The value of Christianity lies in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that, that doctrinal purpose then has a, a practical or a pastoral import upon the people to whom it was originally written. You see the first readers who uh, were Jews who professed faith in the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. But the danger was that some who had professed or said that they had trusted Christ were uh, going to abandon that profession and renounce Christianity and return to their Judaism. Now, why was that a danger? Well, because they were a persecuted people. There are other reasons as well, but they were persecuted and they had to make some kind of a choice. Either uh, those who had professed faith simply were not yet true believers uh, either they were going to make the choice to go forward, to receive Christ in truth, to have that link of faith with Christ, or they were going to go backward into Judaism. The point was they couldn't have both Christ and Judaism. That would be impossible. Now, the thing about Christianity is that it seemed as if these people had nothing to show for their association with Jesus Christ. You know, what their, their fellow Jews might have said, what have you got in Christianity? I mean, you claim that this man was the Messiah and uh, all you've got is persecution. He hasn't come uh, to uh, deliver you. He hasn't come to set up a kingdom. All you've got is persecution. Um, you know, why, why did you leave your God-given religion, uh, the religion of your fathers, uh, a religion in which you could um, smell the incense and... Uh, watch the sacrifices being offered and uh, uh, enjoy the atmosphere in these great festivals that we, that we have and uh, observe the priests in their, their, their services to God and all of these different kinds of things. What have you got? You don't have any of these things anymore. You have nothing to show for this switch to Christianity. Well, the reader of the Hebrews corrects that because they do have something and uh, what they have is Christ and Christ outweighs all of those other things that they don't have. Now, there's a, a practical point there, I think, for us as believers as well. You know, as Christians, sometimes we are called to suffer. Uh, sometimes we're called to be despised or misrepresented, but uh, it might happen more and more as time goes on. Uh, but remember this, having Christ makes up for it all. And uh, all that we have in Christ and all that we know of Christ should make us 
uh, more than willing to sacrifice for him. So a great lesson maybe just at the introduction here is this. The superiority of Christianity lies in the supreme glory of Christ, the Son of God. Christian, Christianity isn't superior just because it has a better moral ethic. It might have that or a, a, it matches better with reality. As far as worldview is concerned, it definitely does have that as well. But it is ultimately better because of the person that is central to it, the revealer of God, Lord Jesus Christ, the redeemer of uh, sinners. Now, chapter 1 and 2 of Hebrews really are the pillars upon which the book of Hebrews is built because in these two chapters, the personal glories of the Lord Jesus Christ are revealed to us. In chapter 1, we have his deity. In chapter 2, his humanity. And we're going to take a look at, at uh, his deity, I suppose, particularly here in chapter 1. And uh, we're going to just read the first four verses of, of the chapter. So we'll do that now. Ver verse number one down to verse number four of chapter one. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now in these first four verses of the book of Hebrews, we discover that God is speaking and or that God has spoken and that he has spoken in his Son. We're going to learn that he is superior here to the Jewish prophets. The reason for that is that the full and final revelation of God is in him. So verse 1 to 4, God speaks in his son. Now, of course, God did reveal truth about himself and his purpose through the Old Testament prophets. But in the son, there's a full, a complete Revelation. So we're going to think, uh, just left a few points out of these verses. First of all, the certainty of God speaking. Uh, we, we do read here that God spake in times past and God in these last days has spoken unto us. So it is certain that God has spoken. It is certain that God spoke through the Old Testament prophets and it is certain that God has spoken in his son now this is good because without god speaking we would never have known him uh, in fact in the book of job we read canst thou by searching find out god uh, you know it would be impossible for a human being uh, using their intellect unaided without the benefit of divine revelation to find out God. There is an inscrutability about God, but God has spoken. And by doing that, he has made himself knowable to us. Now, the fact that God has spoken both in Christianity and uh, in Judaism uh, really distinguishes these from the religions of the world. And the writer of the Hebrews is very careful to acknowledge that it is through the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament revelation in Christ that God has made himself known. I want then to think about the contrasts in God speaking. Because uh, there, there, there's a number of contrasts and uh, there's a contrast, for example, in time. We read here about God speaking through the prophets in time past. But in these last days, he's spoken unto us in his son. Now, the times past refer to all the ages uh, through the Old Testament. As we read through the Old Testament, right up to the book of Malachi, God's voice was heard time and time again. But in these last days, which I take to mean these final conclusive days of revelation, God has spoken in some. God did speak formally. God has spoken finally. 
And then there is a contrast in the recipients of this revelation. In verse 1 we read that God spoke unto the fathers. And then here we read, in verse 2 we read that God has spoken unto us. So the fathers are the ancestors of the Jewish nation at this time, the Jewish believers. And uh, we can remember that they were the particular recipients of the articles of God. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, Paul uh, asked the question, what advantage then has the Jew? And the answer is given, unto them were committed the articles of God. They had tremendous blessing in possessing and hearing and having delivered to them the truth of God's word. Uh, that happened in the Old Testament to the fathers, but now he has spoken unto us. A, a fresh, a full revelation has been given to others. And the biggest contrast really to notice is the contrast in the messenger. Uh, you see, we, we read that in, in verse 1 that he spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken unto us in Son. Now the prophets of course were spokesmen for God. They were stewards. There was committed to them a deposit of truth and they delivered that deposit. They, they communicated it to others. But the Son is infinitely superior to prophets. And it doesn't just say that God spoke by his Son, but it, it says that he spoke in Son. That is, it, it is speaking about the nature of of the son uh, it was in his relationship to god as son that the lord jesus fully revealed god it is because of who he is essentially as the son that he could do such a thing now um we, we could think of this word son in a couple of different ways we could think that it stresses intimacy with god which it does and we could think uh, primarily that it stresses equality with God. You see, think of intimacy with God. John 1, 1, we read in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then down that chapter we read, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now we need bring these two things together well, what we have really is the pic picture of a, a person who is in intimate personal relationship with the father from all eternity perfect unbroken eternal intimacy being enjoyed between a father and a son of course the closer our relationship is the more a person can reveal about the one to whom they are so closely related suppose i wanted to learn something about you i don't know you at all um i don't know who watched this video but suppose i wanted to know something uh, about you well i could speak to someone in the group of christians that you hang out with and they could tell me something or i could speak to your work colleagues and they could tell me something more but if i wanted to know a lot more detail about you well, what i could do is this i could go to your family members the the closest people uh, to you in your life i could speak to your wife or your husband or your mother or father or children and of course because of their long-term intimate relationship that they have with you they could tell me much about you and so so there is someone who has eternally been in unbroken fellowship with God and who knows all that there is to know about God. And his revelation then will certainly be fuller than that small revelation given to each of the prophets. So there's intimacy with God. But more than that, there is equality with God. You see, some have mistaken the, 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 the word son to have the thought of inferiority attached to it but nothing could be further from the the truth of the new testament and the jews understood this perfectly in fact in john chapter 5 when when the jews weren't happy with the lord uh, doing a miracle on, on the sabbath day 
he, he said to them, my father works hitherto and I work. And the Jews became even more angry. And uh, why was that? Well, because they sought, it says they sought the more to kill him because he said that God was his own father, making himself equal with God. You see, to claim sonship as the Lord did was to claim equality with the father. And the Jews understood that. It was really a claim to possessing the essential nature of the Father, uh, the essential nature of God. And, and so the stress here is that the messenger involved in delivering this final revelation is no less than God. And you see, that's important because it is God alone who can fully reveal God to men. So he's the Son. He's intimate with the Father. He's equal to the Father. He's not only the messenger uh, as the prophet would be speaking for God, but he is himself the message communicated from God to men. So these are various contrasts. There's another contrast we could say in the completeness then of the revelation, because that, that's, that's very important. We read in verse number one, that uh, it was uh, at sundry times and in divers manners that God spoke. We could say in, in many parts and in many ways, or at many times and in many ways, God spoke. The Old Testament revelation, that's looking back, was not a complete revelation. It was given little by little. Uh, piece by piece the jigsaw puzzle of divine revelation was given uh, it was given in parts over a period of many years and it was given using all different methods in many ways you know some prophets simply proclaimed their message then there were others uh, take a ezekiel as an example and he kind of acted out a, a message sometimes and then sometimes the life of a prophet was really the message that they were conveying. Think of the prophet Jonah. And so there was poetry and preaching and there were these performances and there was prose written. And uh, the Old Testament really is, is a picture book with all different means of communication being used and all of it important. But the revelation given was never complete. To try and illustrate that, you imagine trying to put together a, a jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the lid of the box to follow. And, and without all the pieces as well, just a few pieces. So each piece you have, each, each piece you have is a correct piece, but the big picture is not going to be clear. Now that was Old Testament revelation. In contrast, when the Son of God came, people were suddenly presented with the lid of the jigsaw box and uh, in fact the whole box with all of the pieces inside. Suddenly everything was clear and the relation of all the parts to the whole could be clearly seen. So there is a, a past revelation in the Old Testament which was partial and it was progressive it, it built uh, throughout the centuries and throughout the millennia up until the new testament but there is a, a final revelation and this is a a full revelation and this is going to be this this is going to be evident by what we're going to say just what what follows on from this in the verses that remain in our little section because in verse uh, uh three Two to four, really. In verse two to four, we, we have a, a sevenfold description of the Son of God. And of course, the number seven in the Bible is the number of completeness and perfection. Uh, and in this portion, it stresses complete and perfect revelation from God communicated in his Son. So, so let's think about this sevenfold description for a few moments. Uh, we read uh, uh, in Son, number one, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Number two, by whom also he made the worlds. Number three, who being the brightness of his glory. Number four, 
and the express image of his person, number five, and upholding all things by the word of his power, number six, when he had by himself purged our sins, number seven, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the, the central statement here really is in verse number three, the express image of his person. And this, we'll see, stresses the very essence of deity belonging to the Son of God. But we want to work through these different uh, statements that are made concerning the Lord Jesus, just to see that the re revelation of God in him is full and final. So we're going to think then just about the completeness of God speaking. Now we can structure these very simply and we'll do it just as we go through but first of all we have the son in in god's purpose and that statement one and two so we'll look at those first of all uh, we read about whom he has appointed heir of all things so um so the heir is uh, the rightful owner or the lawful possessor of of property uh, the son here is the one to whom all things belong as of personal divine right. He is appointed to this as by God himself. It is God who has purposed this. And it is in respect of all things. There is nothing in creation of which the son of God is not in God's purpose the rightful owner. Now we read in Colossians 1 that he is before all things and that all things were created by him and that all things were created for him. And we're going to see here in verse number 3 that he upholds all things by the word of his power. All of this is, is wonderful. All things belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the rightful possessor of everything by divine purpose and by inherent right. Of course, that isn't just evident to all of us at present by, by sight. In fact, we read in chapter 2 that we see not yet all things put under him, but they are his by virtue of divine right and in divine purpose they will be manifestly placed under his feet. And then the second uh, statement is by whom also he made the world. Now that word also, it links the two expressions together. So he's the one by whom God made the world. Here we have his agency in, in creation. And this word worlds uh, often means ages in the New Testament. Uh, and so the son is the agent through whom the ages of time came into existence now we know that the bible tells us in other places that all things were made by him that all things were created by him and very often we refer that to the cosmos the universe and we're thinking of matter we're thinking of space but of course the universe in its totality is all of time and space and matter and all of that has come into being through or in or by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very structure of the ages, the arrangement of time itself brought into existence through his agency. So he's the active creator of all of time and space and matter. He's the possessor of all things and he's the producer of all things. He is the goal of history and he is the guide of history. All things were created by him and they are created for him. He is the beginning and he is the ending. So God's revelation therefore is superior in his son because the son isn't just a, a, a performer or participant in this divine program. He is the great purpose for the program. He's not an actor on the stage of history. He's the aim. He's the arranger of all of history. Prophets had their day and they graced the scene, the, the, the stage of human history for a short time. 
but all of history is leading up to the glorification of the Son of God. Revelation is certainly superior in him. The Son in, in God's purpose. But what about the Son in his own person? And these are the third, fourth and fifth statement bring these things together. Uh, the, these three really in some translations are, are viewed just as one uh, continual sentence. And uh, they they stress a number of things about the Lord. First of all, uh, we read who being the brightness of his glory. Now, the idea here is that there, there's a timeless reality here. Uh, the Son of God is essentially, eternally, the brightness of God's glory. He is the outshining. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The glory of God shines out in his Son. All that God is in the glory of his eternal being is expressed to us in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's an old uh, writer who put it like this. William Lincoln was his name. And he, he said this, he said, There is no thought in the mind of God, but Christ is its expression. There is no glory in God, but Christ is its manifestation. Now, God's glory is revealed, of course, in many ways. This The sky above us, the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament, the, the telling out of the seers, the prophets. But it is only fully revealed in the Son of God. There, there's restriction in, in the glory revealed in the sky. And uh, there, there's, there's um, restraint in, in, in the glory revealed in the Shekinah. And there's reserve in the glory uh, revealed in those Old Testament seers and prophets, but there is no such thing in the revelation of the Son of God. So the question is, do I want to know what God is like? This is a big question. Do I want to know what God is like? Well, I look at the Son. He is the express image of God's person. So not only is he the expression, as we've thought, but he this is this has the idea of him being essentially God. Now, the express image here means the exact impress, the exact impress. Now, you think of, of a, a stamp and uh, the, the, uh, the stamp is used and there is a resultant image that is created. So there's a, a replica produced. And the, what is produced is an exact correspondence to that which is on the stamp. But the idea here is this. How is it that the Lord Jesus is in some sense the exact replica of God or, or the exact, has exact correspondence with, with God? Well, it is as to his essence or substance the word person means that it refers to the essence of a thing the very nature of it the substance of it so what this is saying is this the son exactly corresponds in essence with god hey, there couldn't be any clearer statement of deity than that so when there's any confusion in respect of the deity of the lord jesus christ this is a lovely verse that confirms that he is no less than God manifest in flesh. There are many, I think there's eight times over, when he is directly referred to as God in the Bible. Think of um, Isaiah 7, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, John 1, the word was God, the word became flesh. Uh, Romans 9, Christ came, who is God over all, blessed forever, and so on. Not only that, but he upholds all things by the word of his power. So he's here viewed as the son in relation to creation. But his relationship to it is a, a further confirmation of his deity because he upholds all things. Now, there is in, in Greek mythology a, a god by the name of Atlas. And you can see pictures of him and sculptures of him and you have 
him with the, the, the world upon his shoulders, on his back. And he's bowed down low under the weight of the pressure of carrying the weight of the world on his shoulder. A great burden that he wanted to get rid of. But here we have the Son of God. And he's upholding all things and there's no sweat upon his brow in the doing of it. And in fact, he's doing more than that. He, he's carrying it all along. That's the idea. He's bringing it to its intended goal and destination. So he's maintaining everything. He's sustaining everything. He's controlling everything. He's guiding everything. Hi. No great exertion of energy as far as he is concerned in the sense that he is exhausted or anything of the sort. Simply by the word of his power. Now the Bible says by the word of the Lord where the heavens meet. Peter tells us that by the same word they're kept in store. The planets move in, in their orbits and the, the seasons follow their patterns and the animals migrate and they multiply across the, the world and it's all by the word of the Lord. I just link that back to this thought of the, the revelation of God in his Son. So the Son of God is central to divine purpose. And the Son of God is a divine person, fully expressing deity, possessing the full essence of deity, exercising the power of, of deity in his sovereign control of the universe. So evidently, through these spokesmen, the prophets, there could not be as complete a revelation as in the sun. I want to conclude uh, the time is pretty much gone but I want to think about the sun and his pathway this is the sixth and seventh of these statements and uh, there's a time factor really introduced to these because the Lord enters into history and it says when he had by himself purged our sin he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So the Son acts to bring cleansing to the universe. He made purification for sins. He made a basis for the cleansing of sin. Now this, this brings before us the importance of Calvary. You know, we, we, we move down from the exalted sphere of the eternal God controlling the universe and so on. And we find ourselves in the shade of an old rugged cross here god has been revealed as never before it was in the shadow of the cross that there was the fullest outshining of divine glory the lord said i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished the work that thou gavest me to do if any person was to experience true cleansing I know the removal of defilement. If the world itself was to experience a change, a transformation and cleansing, what was needed was the shedding of the blood of the Son of God upon the cross. He did it, it says, by himself. You know, in relation to the controlling or creating of the universe, there was no great cost and plight in, in, in the doing of that. Just the word of his power. But cleansing being provided, a foundation being laid for the universe to be purged from every vestige of defilement. Well, that involved his involvement. That required his involvement, his suffering. And our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us so that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify unto himself a people for his own possession zealous of good works he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high this is the final description of the seven and all the previous lead up to this point who sat down it is the son of god that we've been considering here and uh how did he sit down? He set himself down that's the idea he set himself down taking a position that was rightfully his the right hand of the majesty on high. Where did he sit down? The right hand of the majesty 
on high. There is no place higher. There is no place too high for him that can be found. No place too high in heaven. But it says he did so being made. The idea is this. Being made by so much better than the angels. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What does that mean? Well, the Son has already been shown to be far superior to, to angels. He's no less than God. But the idea here is this, that his position, the position to which he has ascended. As to his position, he has been made so much higher than the angels. Because he ever is personally so much greater than they are. The universe was out of sync when the Lord was upon earth, reviled and rejected. But now he's in his rightful place. My time is gone. A, a practical point. Sometimes believers wonder why God allows such and such a thing uh, in their experience and life. Maybe a trial, a trouble, a test, suffering, sickness. Uh, and maybe there's a doubt comes in just about the character of God. Remember this, the full revelation of God is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Him says, fix your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Remember this, if you're confused about some part of the Bible you don't understand, remember this, the truth is in Jesus. The full revelation is in the person of Christ. You grasp a hold of that, it'll bring stability and peace and joy and contentment and tranquility into your soul. Trust the Lord will bless his word to us. Thank you.